You're watching Granada Breeze. It seems amazing, but this late in the year, we can still sit out in the warm sunshine, surrounded by these wonderful autumnal reds and golds. It's just perfection in the garden at the moment. And adding to the perfection, this week, John Ravenscroft will be showing us some Australian plants that we've never seen before. Reg Mool says if you want a good, soft fruit crop next summer, now's the time to do the forward planning. And Ken Crowther goes down a hole to produce some organic compost. But let's start now with Nigel Snow, who's busy putting a pair of tights on a cordial line. Well, you don't need a calendar today to tell you what time of year it is. The temperatures have definitely taken a dive. And now's the time to look around the garden and decide which of your plants need bringing in, which are going to be fine, and which just need a bit of help, really. Cordial lines are fine as long as they're three to four years old and plus. But youngsters really do need a bit of help. And especially if they're in pots, one good tip is to pull all the leaves up together like this and then get yourself an old stocking or a tight and pull that down over the top. And what that does is bring all the foliage over the bud in the center. And that will mean that will protect it from the winter. That's a good start. Now the plants I'm sat next to here, these are penstemons, and they're magnificent. You get these huge trumpet-like flowers. But for us in Cheshire, they're not really reliably hardy. You can do a lot to making them hardy. You can give them a good background, like we've got here with this evergreen hedge, and that will mean they get some protection from the wind. The soil that they're growing in is sandy and being well drained is a lot to do with being hardy. Wet heavy clay will make even the hardiest plants think twice during the winter months. So good well drained soil. I've started putting straw around these plants because that is going to do a lot. It's going to trap the air in there, it's going to keep the foliage on and the straw will mean that warm air will be trapped inside the plants and not let the frost get at it. Another thing you can do is to put around the bottom some of this material. This is an open composted bark and you really just shove it in there, tease it down in between the stems and it will make a lovely sort of warm cosy roost at the bottom where the frosts can't get. It's really going to make that much difference. One thing you shouldn't do at this time of year is to do any pruning because this foliage, it might get damaged, it probably will get damaged in the winter, but it won't matter because while it's being damaged, it will protect the root, which is quite shallow, from the effects of the frost. And in the springtime, we can shear this off and then we'll end up with even bigger and better blooms than last year. So once you've shoved the straw in, you put the mulch in, then really you can tidy it up a bit more and also help matters a bit more. This is a material which is very freely available. It's a polypropylene a type of plastic netting. It's quite easy to, to buy. You can use it as greenhouse shading or you can use it like I'm going to use it here as a windbreak and stretched across the front of this border or put in a square around a plant which is relatively tender. It's really quite easy, the wind lets you, just to use drawing pins or staples and pin it to some stakes into the shape that you want. And you'll find that doing it like this, you can then keep off not only the worst of the wind and therefore the frost, but you'll also be keeping off the snow and you'll be keeping 
animals out as well if they have any pests or any nuisance. And the whole thing, I think, really looks quite acceptable. And it's good for the plants as well. They mean they'll be even better next year. You may remember that last year we built this compost bin out of old pallets. It's nicely full of compost now, it's rotting down very well, but this time we thought we'd show you a method, particularly if you don't want a bin in your garden, you can actually dig a hole in the ground and make your compost heap actually in the ground. There's a lot of fuss made about what you can put in a compost bin, heap, whatever you've got in your garden, but the most important thing is that you actually have a method of making compost in your garden because it is so valuable. Everything in your kitchen can, in some way, go into the compost bin. I've been potato peelings. They can go in. I've been eating red cabbage, as you can see. And yes, red cabbage can equally, that can go in. All your old windfalls, plenty of old windfalls, they can go in as well. Just drop those in. And beans, beans that we've been pulling off the old bean plants, they can again all go in. Now a lot of you put eggshells in. Now eggshells are a bit of a problem because inside the eggshell there's actually a lining of the egg lays against the membrane of the egg and in fact that can encourage vermin. So what you actually need to do is before you bring these down and put them in the compost heap or the bin, you need actually to rinse these in a colander and get all that slimy bit out of the eggshell before you put it down. If not you definitely have vermin. Bits of apple, apple peels, they can all go in. And then, I know a lot of you are tempted, very old bread, chuck it in. No, it definitely must not go in. You'll get rats and mice in for that as well. And last but not least, something that we chuck a few bits away, gristle and fat of meat. Be very careful that you don't put that again into this compost heap because you really will have lots of trouble with vermin. So let's get rid of the eggshells for now because I haven't rinsed them. So we're not going to put those in there. And we'll just, there's another one, we don't want that either. Get rid of that. And we'll just throw the rest of that in there. Now over here, we've got something else that, again, every garden should be trying to do, and that's to shred all his cuttings and bits and pieces. You can see I've been pruning compost, doing all that sort of thing. And that's all, again, lovely shredded material. Let's get that in and tip that nicely in there. Put that about. These are all... The old marrows, we've been, look at, ooh, we don't want the polythene in there, that's something we definitely don't want. All this in here, nicely in. And then the thing, chuck old apples in, chop it well down with a spade. That's nice. And then what I would also do is just put a bit of activator in. And you just sprinkle a bit of activator the top of it because that will help to rot it down. Then a layer of soil and that's what we do. Just put that back over the top. Not too much, just a thin layer and you're starting to actually create a very successful compost heap. Then as your rubbish accumulates all you have to do is actually put some more rubber greenery across the top, more soil, more activator, and build it up until it's right up to the height of the soil again. Come next year, you've got the most beautiful compost you could imagine. And therefore, you can enrich your garden with this beautiful compost. Well, we've turned over our information spot to a couple of topical tips this week. I suppose that makes us a couple of topical tips, doesn't it? Yes, or topical tipsters. We're old topical tipsters. We're standing in front of these runner beans for a good reason, aren't we, <laughs> Edge? Yes, they've really finished being interesting for us now. They've finished cropping and there's nothing much going on. And a lot of people would just rip them out and um, put them on the compost heap and that would be that. Yeah. But the tip concerns the bottom part, really, then the roots, because the roots of, of runner beans and all other leguminous plants have actually got the ability to take nitrogen, which is one of our major fertilisers, out of the air and actually place it in the soil where it's of benefit to following crops. Right. You know? And it's, it's the bacteria that live in the nodules on the roots that do this job. So if you just cut off your beans just above the ground and compost all the, the top growth, yep. 
and meanwhile you can leave the roots where they are and they'll carry on working, enriching the soil with valuable nitrogen. Brilliant, so it's nice eco-friendly, saves you buying fertiliser yeah. and it's a good organic thing to do. Yes, that's Excellent, right. that's a superb tip. Now what's this thing down here? Well this is a hedgehog box. We've all heard of bird boxes and things like that and yeah. he hedgehogs are useful things to have in your garden really, the same way that birds are because of course uh, hedgehogs eat snails and slugs and things like that and so in order to keep them in your garden why not give them somewhere to hibernate during the winter Good idea. and around about this time of year they'll be looking for a nice snug hideaway and and this is it you can set this up on some boxes in your garden you've got a nice little entrance hall there and they come through into the living quarters uh, you line it with newspaper put a bit of straw outside for them to gather their own bedding in yeah. um, cover it with some polythene maybe put some sticks against it to make it blend in with the rest of the garden and there you are sounds like a fairy tale doesn't it yeah chateau Finally. hedgehog <laughs> <laughs> but just quickly, but yes. what about this? Well, this is an apple that's got brown rot. It's a mummified apple. Collect these up if you've got them on your trees, because if you don't, that's the source of infection for future years. And that's our topical tip spot for this week. It's quite good, really. They're all covered in food. Cheery corn and cheery oats, cheery rice and wheat. Cheery for green Cheerios, cheery good to eat. They're nutritious and delicious. Cheerios, so good to eat. It takes four whole grain oats to make the one and only Cheerios. Cheerios, so good to eat. Open a box of Cheerios, hit fireworks, and you've instantly won £2,000, a holiday to Futuroscope in France, or a Mercedes. Happy New Millennium from Cheerios. However hard you clean, some smells just won't go away. Nothing gets rid of odours on fabrics like Febreze. I spray my curtains, my carpets, my couch. Nothing gets rid of smoky smells like this does. It's even safe on my favourite dress. It doesn't cover up one smell with another. Febreze finds the bad odours trapped in fabrics and gets rid of them safely. It's like it's been hung outside. Once it's dry, it's bye-bye smell. This stuff gets rid of smells on fabrics. Febreze gets bad smells out of fabrics for good. At Campbell's, we've found a different way of making fresh tasting soup. We put in the finest vegetables and herbs. Then after we put in a little time and care, we put it in a carton, sealing in the freshness. And the difference? You can put it in the cupboard. Campbell's, fresh tasting soup that lasts. To keep such beautiful designs looking that way, Pearson Fionda recommends special care instructions. Secret antiperspirant, specially designed to keep women beautifully dry. Danger adhesive? I don't need that, or so I thought. I just held back on certain foods, made sure no one noticed when I was talking or laughing. Then I thought enough was enough, so I tried Fixident. It gave me fantastic hold. In fact, there's nothing better. It's almost like having my real teeth back. Feel the Fixident difference all day long. Hello, Jean from Stockport. What's your question? Hello, Gloria. How can I spread the cost of Christmas? Ah, that's an easy one, Jean. Give Fairpack Hampers a call. Do you know you can get all your meat and groceries? Really? And your drinks. Plus, you can spread the cost over 45 weeks. And that goes for all your gifts, toys and shopping vouchers, too. Fairpack? That's right. And there's up to 25% commission. The number's 0800 731 9866. Phone now and they'll send you a free catalogue for Christmas 2000. Thanks, Gloria. I asked Mars to settle an argument between me and my sister. <laughs> Send in your ideas now and Mars will pick a winner a day until the year 2000. Welcome back. I'm just enjoying the last of these autumn raspberries. This is autumn bliss. One of the best, best varieties, I think, because they fruit much later into the, into the autumn and have really big fruits on. One thing we have got with them, though, a little bit of this magnesium deficiency, which seems to be a bit of a, a general problem here. So at the moment, it won't make much difference. The leaves will be coming off soon, and we'll just treat that in the spring and, and sort it out then. But uh, that's what, uh, what that problem is. 
but really we're here today to uh, have a look at planning ahead really we're going to be taking some hardwood cuttings from some of the uh, currants and gooseberries here in order to give us more bushes for future years now hardwood cuttings are really one of the simplest things to do you don't need any special equipment and you do them at a time of year when the garden's getting a bit quieter isn't maybe quite it's not quite so hectic as it was earlier in the year although of course there's still plenty to do now we start off with uh, with this one this is a, a black currant and all you do is you take a piece of the the current year's growth that's around about a foot or 30 centimeters if you've got a metric garden long and you just uh, cut it off just below a bud at the bottom like that there we go follow the stem up and it wants to be around about nine inches or so long you just really take off the soft tip like that there we go strip off any odd leaves that's left on it and basically um, you know that that's a hardwood cutting I mean, it's not difficult is it at all and you don't need any special equipment to root them either so that's that one similarly here we've got a red currant and as before really you cut it below a leaf joint there and as I said you know current years grow about as thick as a pencil and you cut it above a bud at the top like that take the foliage off it and that's another one so they say really is quite simple gooseberries which are these chaps here again a similar thing it's a little bit more complicated because you've got thorns on it but again you cut below a bud follow it up around about uh, nine inches or so and cut above a bud with a sloping cut like that now if you want to with these you can take the thorns off but uh, you just push them one way and then the other and uh, you know the thorns will come off quite readily but it's not really necessary and another thing that people had used to do was rub off the lower buds as well the idea there was that you got a bush that had a leg and then branches on the top but nowadays we've found that they'll root just as well if not a bit better if you don't do that and then to insert them I'm just going to show you how to do it here I won't actually leave them here but you just need to make a slit in the ground like that with a spade that's all you need to do open it up a bit and then into there you put some ordinary sand just to fill the the slit up a bit of sand like that that just gives them a, a bit of drainage and then you take your cutting make sure you've got it the right way up and just insert it down into the soil there into the sand so that two-thirds of it are below the ground and about one-third above the ground like that and put them in in batches of one sort or another so they're all all together the same variety just lightly firm them in with your foot and those will root gradually starting now next autumn they'll be there for us to put out it seems quite a long time to me since I've stood behind this bench and I suppose that reflects the good summer we had. But as autumn and winter coming on and thinking more about indoor houseplants, well, it's good to be back here again looking at something new from Australia. We in Europe have about 4,000 species of plant native to Europe, I'm told. And I'm told that although it's probably never been counted, Australia, which is where this plant group here has come from, they've got 16,000. And of course, on top of that, South Africa's got as many, Mexico's got a huge number. So logically, why aren't houseplants more fascinating, more interesting than they are currently when there's a sort of boredom factor coming in with them all looking so much the same? Well, in an attempt to find out, every now and again, we bring large batches of interesting plants from places like Australia. All this batch have come from Queensland, and this is part of about two, three hundred different things we recently acquired from, New, uh, from Queensland. Well, one of the reasons is their light conditions and our light conditions. Quite a lot of this stuff needs higher light conditions than we normally have in Europe. And what we're looking for is the adaptability of the plants. Start with something I've never seen before, except in my daughter's garden in Canberra, where I no didn't really take a lot of notice. Can I show that so that it looks quite presentable still? It's called Graptophyllum. Now, we know little about it. 
it's called elistifolium, Gratiophyllum elistifolium, leaf holly like, evergreen. Ignore the rather hideous pot, that's an Australian aberration. We don't really care to do that. We like our pots to be neutral. But that will make a little shrub. This you might have seen. This is a curcuma, curcuma australasica. So up comes this flower spike, later comes the foliage. Now those we already have tried in a small way growing, and I'm quite hopeful for those. They're rather novel, aren't they? Because we're always looking for something. The bit of petal damage here is as a result of a long trip from Queensland. This is called Ciororia, but it's going to be called Blushing Bride by the Australians. Now this I do love. It's one of the paper flowers. This I feel will certainly grow for us in Britain. Well, on to a few that already are working well for us. Baronias, with a wonderful scent, heterophylla this one. I can smell it from here. They're already being grown on quite a large scale in Israel, where the climate suits it, in parts of northern Germany, where the poinsettias are growing in great numbers. Here's the Geraldton wax, which is the national flower of Western Australia, I think it is, yes. And this is already growing again quite happily in parts of Europe, so I'm quite sure it's like conditions that we have here will suit it. I couldn't be sure about things in the Proteaceae like this, but they are growing on Tresco. I've seen them there. A bit angular, but I think it could be treated as a house plant. But this is a fascination. Now over on this side, you're all now seeing these. This is Anaxanthus, the bear's paw. And that's a very acceptable house plant indeed. But 10 years ago, wasn't known in this country. Over here, lastly, are Callistemons. This is Citrinus, grows on the south coast. But there are dozens of others. So this is what I find fun in houseplants, is trying to find something to extend the range. A lot of what's on this table will grow in your conservatories. And the further south you are, the better. The better light conditions you've got, the better. But half the fun for us is trying. We've several dozen more things we're trying. We'll see how they go through the winter. We'll see how they perform next summer. But all this is to make gardening more fascinating for all of us. Just there, <laughs> and so to the post bag. First letter out of the post bag this week is from Jennifer Brook, who lives in Wrexham. And she mm -hmm. wants to know about her tomato plant, Nigel. Could you tell her why the tomato plant should go s grow small roots all the way up the stem? She's grown tomatoes for years, she says, and this has never happened before. So, yeah. what do you think? Well, it's a funny she, old thing, isn't it? She sends a stem in, and there's a couple of clues here, really. Now, uh, the camera can see there, yeah. it's split. Right. Now, I've seen roots coming out of tomato stems before. In fact, when you pot them on, you pot them on deep because of that, so you get extra root. Mm -hmm. So this is not really anything out of the extraordinary. But the split yeah. has opened up, and I think that's what's caused all these roots these to come. These extra roots to come. See, they're oh. all the way up. Gracious, yes. And they come all the way up the stem. Now, talking amongst uh, fellow presenters there, I think what we decided was that the fluctuations in the temperature, it was hot, it was dry, and then it was wet, and yeah. it was cool. And that's what's caused the split, and then the split has prompted it into rooting like this. Is it going to cause a problem? Well, it's just a one-off. I mean, it's over now, and the fruit was fine. It's so just one of those wonderful things from nature. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> and something to talk about at a dinner party or something. <laughs> These are my tomatoes, and look at this, this very strange root all this the way through it. Adventitious roots. Oh, well, that's, that's wonderful. So nothing at all to worry about, but thank no. you for giving us something to wonder about. <laughs> now June Winspear has written to us from Manchester and uh, she wanted to know about a, this plant. Oh yes. It's an identification thing. She said she's had it in a plant pot on the patio all summer. Now the bottom leaves are turning brown so for the moment she's transferred it to her potting shed. Yes. What is it? And is she it's doing the right stuff? Euphorbia, wolf and I, one of the uh, Caracas types and uh, it's fine. It's perfectly hardy. It wants to stay yeah. outside. But this is quite a young plant, and you see all the foliage is right down to the base of the compost. Yep. But as it ages, that foliage is what is the oldest foliage on, and that then starts to come away. So it then starts to look more like a like a tree, right. and then it develops a trunk and a stem, and, and it gets about woody. four or five foot high. Yeah, and starts yep. looking woody, and the, of course the bottom leaves yellow and start to drop off. So it's quite a natural process. So has she done the right thing by taking it into the shed? 
There's no need at all. No, no need. Can go Leave back it outside where it is. again. Yeah. Okay. It's better in the ground. Yep. Um, but really, as far as the weather goes, it will tolerate all our weather and yeah. come out of it smiling. Love these euphorbias because they've got this wonderful little rosy pink tinge on, on the edge. And the flowers last forever and ever because okay. they're bracts, they're not the flowers. It's oh. the lime green bract around it that gives you the colour. Yeah. And so they seem to be in flower for months. Is that right? Mm. Yeah. Very and architectural. How often do you need to feed a euphorbia this time of year? Any, oh, any always in the spring and then once or twice in the summer with a, a soluble feed because yeah. they're quick acting. Yeah. And that's about all really. We've I had just one other quick um, inquiry from a viewer whose name I'm afraid I haven't got in front of us, but this is ideas for plants under huge trees. Any ideas, quickly? Oh, um, geraniums. 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 Geraniums is the answer <laughs> to that one. If you'd like to know anything more about what you should grow under a big tree or anything else that we've talked about in this week's programme, you can, of course, get our fact sheet, which this week is number 354, and you can get it by sending, please, a stamped self-addressed envelope to... Gardener's Diary, Bridgemere Garden World, near Nantwich, Cheshire, CW5 7QB. Don't forget the phone lines 01270 520 455 for instant answers to all your garden queries. Afraid that's it for this week. Till next right. week. Bye bye. Goodbye. On BBC One, you can make the difference.